Good afternoon and welcome to our Hangout with Bright Ideas Press. I am Jimmy Lanley and I have with me today Tyler Hogan, the president of Bright Ideas Press, and two homeschool moms, Heather Woody and Marlene Griffith. And we're going to be discussing the benefits and the cons and how to use textbooks in your homeschool. We're really glad you're with us today for this hangout, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching the YouTube video afterwards. We have quite a few videos on our YouTube channel, so if you'll go to YouTube and search for Bright Ideas Press, you can see all of our videos there. We have tutorials for different products, we have uh, instructional uh, videos about how to use our products, and we have discussions like this with other homeschool moms that have great tips for you. So please uh, check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to us on YouTube. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves now. I'm going to start with Tyler. As I said, he's the president of Bright Ideas Press. So Tyler, would you introduce yourself to our listeners today? Well, I'm Tyler Hogan. I'm a homeschool graduate and now a homeschool dad. I've got four little kiddos, uh, five, four, two, and four months. So we're a uh, we're just getting started on our homeschool adventure. Uh, my wife is also a homeschool graduate, and we just we love it to death. So I'm glad to be here, and this should be an interesting topic. Yes, it will. And I want everyone to know that Tyler is the author of both Wonder Maps and North Star Geography, as well as being the president of Bright Ideas Press. So uh, Marlene, would you introduce yourself? Hey everyone, um, my name is Marlene Griffith, and you can find me blogging over at adiligentheart.com. Um, I have three kiddos. My eldest is in middle school, and then my youngest is just starting out. Um, she'll be going to first grade next year. So I'm kind of all over the map when it comes to homeschooling. I've experienced a lot of it, and now I'm starting all over again. Um, I'm excited to be here to chat with you guys today. Marlene, thank you for bringing that expertise uh, to bear today. We appreciate that. And Heather, introduce yourself, please. I'm Heather Woody at blogsherote.org, and I have four children, ages 16 through 9. So we have an 11th grader, a 9th grader, 7th grader, and 4th grader this year. All right. Thanks, Heather. Heather's a frequent uh, host, uh, host uh, panelist on our Hangouts, and we really appreciate her being part of them. So we're talking about textbooks, and sometimes uh, in the homeschool community, textbooks get a bad rap. Uh, and I will admit that I've been one of those people that has disparaged textbooks as being boring or being constrictive uh, and not being free enough to allow us to pursue our own personal interests when it comes to history, science, or really any topic at all. So uh, today we're going to talk about some of those potential cons, uh, but we're also going to dispel them and show how textbooks actually can be a pro. Uh, I will make a confession. We are now using some textbooks in my daughter's high school learning. So uh, I uh, have turned around on this uh, topic and I do see the value of textbooks. So maybe first actually we should talk about what is a textbook compared to maybe a different approach. So uh, Tyler, can you maybe explain to us what a textbook is and maybe what would be an alternative to a textbook so if people aren't crystal clear? Yeah, that's funny. It's one of those kind of things that you kind of have to define by what it isn't. Uh, when people think of textbooks, they think, okay, this is not hands-on. This is not geared to my kid's learning style. This doesn't have uh, a lot of projects or activities. It's pretty much just text for me to read, a big block of it, probably not much white space, not very visually interesting. And depending on the skill of the author, it may not even be an interesting read. So when you think of a textbook, you know, oftentimes you have that kind of dry, dusty, moldy book smell in your head. And, and that does not have to be the case. There's a lot of textbooks out there that are very well written, are very interesting, and some of them do a, a better job than others of incorporating hands-on activities and appealing to different learning styles. So the, the definition that we're used to tends to be a negative definition, both in terms of things that a textbook isn't and things that we dislike about textbooks. But I think we need to try and work with a, a new definition, and I would just call a textbook any book that has a, an organized and systematic approach to teaching you a body of information. So you could use that definition for a lot of different books, but I, I think that might be a good 
working definition to start with. Okay, that's very helpful, I think, very helpful. And within what you've defined, I can tell that there are many different kinds of textbooks. Uh, and so maybe what we're thinking of in our own public school, high school experience may be quite different from a textbook we could buy for our homeschooler today. Maybe it's a totally different thing. So um, let's jump in and talk about what are some of the pros to using a textbook. Marlene, what do you think are some of the positives? Um, for me, um, I think it kind of it, it feeds in a little bit to my uh, my super structured personality. Um, everything's laid out for me in a sense. I know in the order we're already going to cover things. I'm not having to create that myself. Um, so for me personally, that gives me a lot of peace of mind. Um, I can also look ahead um, very easily because it's all prepared. Um, and if I did happen to want to add something in or I wanted to take something out, or um, I wanted just to tweak something, I can plan for that ahead of time, and I'll know about how much time I have um, to get to that. Okay, so it sounds like Tyler's main definition of what a textbook is is your main pro, which is just the structure. Yeah. Heather, any other uh, positives about textbooks that you like? Well, I think it keeps you moving in a forward direction. So if you are... Uh, family who is a little more relaxed with your homeschooling and you like to take things um, a little as they come but also interest-led, then the textbook can be used to keep you on the right track and, and after you have uh, traveled a little bit in another direction, you always have something to come back to to keep you moving in the forward direction and then at the end, um, you've finished a body of work rather than getting to the end and figuring out, oh, there were some things left that we probably could have done. And if you're a family that does a lot of your own um, unit studies and things like that, sometimes that happens at the end of a year. You look back and you think, um, we left something out, or we didn't get as far as we thought we would. Okay, good point. So using a, a, a textbook can help you organize and schedule and plan, it sounds like that's what you're saying. And so along those lines, I'd like to introduce the word spine. Uh, so we talk about sometimes a history spine, a science spine. Uh, what is a spine and how can a textbook be a spine? Tyler, you want to address that one for us? Well, like we said earlier, structure is a really important part of what makes a textbook useful. And just like the body needs a spine in order to, to stand and everything else just kind of branches off of that, your textbook can serve the same function in your homeschool. So if you have a, a sturdy piece of curriculum, a sturdy textbook that you use as your curriculum spine, what that means is that as you're going through it, you're going to find things as you go through that are just, oh, I want to know more about that. And oh, I want to see how, well, how does this tie into some of my other subjects? And from there, you can go and you know build massive unit studies if you feel like it, but figure out, okay, if, I, if I'm using a history spine, well, let's look at some of the things we can tie in, like our literature. Can we read some historical fiction or some works, um, some other books about that time period? Our geography, how can we incorporate the, the place that all of these events are, are happening in into our studies and what can we learn about these regions? Um, how can we tie in even our, our vocabulary and our spelling and all of these other subjects that may or may not have any direct relation to history, but oftentimes there's more of a, there's more of a connection than you might think just at first glance. So using a curriculum as a spine means that the lessons in the textbook are not where you stop, they're where you start and you keep adding other things to that. You keep exploring in different directions and then af as you conclude your explorations, you can come back to your spine and ask, okay, what's next? We've, we've delved into this, we've gone deep, we've gone wide, where do we go from here? And the spine has another, another layer for you to start investigating. So the spine is just basically your map, your start, your springboard. And you can. It's your map. I like that. It's your, I know you like maps. Yeah. So, so, and as you were saying that, Tyler, you know, uh, I remembered <laughs> that uh, we at Bright Ideas Press have an entire product line called Illuminations, and it is built on using 
uh, the mystery of history and all American history as history spines. We know there are a lot of homeschool moms that do this on their own. They use these series uh, as a history spine and they branch out, but we actually have created a whole program that is already designed in that way, exactly as you said, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's the whole reason that we built Illuminations was because so many people were asking, well, how can I tie in these other subjects and how can I schedule in some good literature to go with my ancient civilization studies or you know, how can I put my, my Bible in with my ancient civilizations? Um, so we, we started thinking and Illuminations grew out of that and it's basically an enormous year-long unit study that ties in your history, your geography, your Bible, your literature, your language arts, your science, pretty much everything but your math, and schedules it all out for you. So, and, and like you said, Jimmy, lots of people can, will do that at home, um, but it, it really is really handy to have it all done ahead of time and to have that teacher prep work cut out because when you're doing your own curriculum design, that can take an incredible amount of research time, especially if you're one of those people like me who, you know, once you start clicking links and visiting websites, you just, you find all kinds of bunny trails and you can go down those roads forever because there's always more to learn. And that's when you have to come back to your spine and say, okay, I just spent three hours researching Hammurabi's code. <laughs> was that really what the whole lesson was supposed to be about or do I need to move on? I have been so guilty of that. In fact, I, I remember realizing that I would spend far more time researching than we would spend studying, and it was just in an inordinate amount of time. And so you, sometimes you have to discipline yourself to just focus on what you need to do. Uh, so it's great. I want everyone to check out Illuminations. If you'll just go to brightideaspress.com, you'll see a link to Illuminations right there on our homepage, and you can check it out. We have some video tutorials. Um, there are free samples you can download for all of the programs. You can see the reading lists. There's a lot of information there. We even have a Build a Bundle tool that's very cool. You pick which period of history you want to study and you add on the different books, whether it's a science book, a geography guide, and you actually can create a whole bundle there for all of your kids, grades three through eight with that one tool. Through high school. Well, that's true, through, even through high school. That's right. That's right. So uh, check that out. That's Illuminations. We'd love for you to, to check that out. So uh, let's keep talking about... Um, textbooks. So uh, let's talk about using textbooks alone versus using textbooks plus something else. I mean, is it okay to just use a textbook alone? Do you always have to use it as a spine or is it okay just to use it on its own? Heather or Marlene? I think it's okay to do either. I think it depends on your kids. So I have two kids this year doing All American History Volume 2 because we're, we've always grown up doing, um, you know, in homeschool, always early history. And my husband this year was like, let's go modern history. So we, did, we decided to pick up with the Civil War and move forward. And I have a ninth grade and an 11th grader doing that. My ninth grader is all about every experience she can have besides what's in the textbook. And my 11th grader is like, just give me the textbook. I want to just get, it, get moving. And so it, we do that together, and their experience is very different. And so, yeah, you can do it either way. Okay, great. Marlene, you have thoughts on that? Um, actually, yeah, it, it's, I was going to say basically the same thing that Heather said, like it can really go um, either way. We tend to use our textbooks as the core of, of everything. Um, I rarely add on to it um, or anything like that unless, um, and a lot of times it's actually the fault of the text, like with All American History um, that my daughter is doing this year. Um, she's wanted to look more into certain topics, so we'll go off and start doing more in addition to it. Typically we'll add on like videos and stuff like that, but the main source of our, of our class and everything comes straight from our texts. That's funny. You know what? All three of us are using All American History this year. My daughter is using All American History Volume 2 as well. And yeah, just today she said, Mom, I finally got to World War One." You know, she was so happy to be 
<laughs> a little more modern history. So yeah, you know, uh, she only uses the textbook. We don't add anything at this point. I think, especially in high school, when things get more challenging, you don't have as much time for those extras, or you save the time for your child's passions. And you know, for her, history is not her passion, and then that's okay. Uh, and so she spends her time on the things she really, really loves, and and she does the textbook for the history, and it works really well for us. And I know that it is uh, comprehensive; and it's covering everything she needs to know. And our umbrella school, uh, we're required by law in Tennessee to have an umbrella school. Our umbrella school recognizes all American history as a great choice. So when I say I'm using all American history by Brad Is Press, they're totally content, no questions. They know that it's a good curriculum, so I'm happy. I'm happy with it. So, uh, what would be some uh, cons to using a textbook, uh, especially maybe in younger grades? Well, textbooks are not generally written to appeal to a wide variety of learning styles. And in particular, they're not usually very appealing towards kinesthetic learners. And depending on how good of a graphic designer they have, they, they may not be very appealing to visual learners either. So if you have a, a book that you are just sitting there and reading and, and your child is having their eyes glaze over because it just doesn't do anything for their learning style, then you, know, you can be a little bit stuck with that unless you bring in some additional supplements. So the, you know, the accusation that textbooks are boring, well, it can be really true. I mean, it all depends on the kid and on the textbook. I mean, no two kids are the same, and no two textbooks are the same either. So you really want to try and find a good fit if you're going to be using a textbook, especially for younger ones. In high school, you know, they can, they can muscle through it a little bit better, but, you know, I, I wouldn't expect my kindergartner to just work through a textbook if that's not her learning style. I mean, that, that would be killer for my first grader. Mm -hmm. One of the main contrasts I've heard about that textbooks are very fact-based, very you know sequential event after event, fact after fact, date after date, uh, versus maybe a living books approach, which is a more of narrative approach. Now I uh, understand that uh, the Mystery of History series is far more narrative in its approach than a typical textbook would be so that you're getting the benefit of this comprehensive spine but you're also getting a more conversational story that will appeal to even younger ages. So uh, Tyler would you say that's a correct uh, assessment of the Mystery of History? Absolutely. Yeah, Linda Hobart did a really amazing thing when she wrote The Mystery of History. Each lesson is written as a letter to the student. So she writes in first person. It feels very personal. You know, she'll she'll give you all the facts that you need, but she also gives you her her thoughts and her feelings and opinions mm -hmm. on the matter, and she'll help you to I mean, she's very clear about distinguishing between the two, which mm -hmm. is that's important. Um, but yeah, just that conversational tone I think is one of the big things that sets it apart from almost every other history curriculum out there. So speaking of tone, uh, I wonder if any of you ladies have encountered any uh, homeschool curricula, especially textbooks, that you didn't care for the tone. You, we don't have to maybe mention them by name. I know we have encountered some that my daughter really was repelled by the tone and the attitude that it had toward the reader. I wonder if any of you have ever experienced that. No? Yes, we have. Okay. Well, tell me about it <laughs> without well, naming names. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's a little harder, but I will do that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think it just depends, too, on I think the worldview that the textbook has. That's where I'll go with that. And, and um, so where the textbook is coming from, I think, is very important because when, when you – start going through it and if you're not partial to that worldview it's going to be there the whole time and even if a textbook company says they don't have one they do everybody has a position that they're coming from and it'll be shining through in the text so and and, and I've seen that yeah anyone who says they doesn't have a worldview is lying yeah, it's true. <laughs> I think they don't know what worldview means. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, I mean, to be fair, that's a problem that you'll find with any material that you use, not just a textbook. You know, if you bring in other supplements or go to certain websites or participate in field trip activities where there's a guide, there's a worldview involved in all of those. But with textbooks, they have that extra weight to them because they're generally speaking with some measure of authority. 
And if you disagree with them fundamentally, that can be very grating on you. And usually it's a big investment. So, you know, if you have a textbook, you're, you're probably planning on using it for a while. If it's just, you know, a little one-week study guide, that's easy to, to ignore and not let it grate on your nerves too much. But if this is something that you're in three days a week, every week for the whole school year, that can get very tedious. I will say my, my daughter's probably a little more particular than some kids, but I remember in very early years uh, her being irritated by a text that she thought was condescending to her. Uh, where it would say, now boys and girls, you might not know, blah, 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 blah. And she'd think, you know, that's just condescending. You don't know what I know and don't know. And uh, she didn't like that tone. And then there was a more recent curriculum choice we made in a textbook. And, and you know, we're a Christian family, but she felt it was too preachy and too pushy. And she felt it was artificial. And that it would have a lesson, and then they would tack on a little Jesus at the end, is what she would say. And uh, she didn't like that. It felt uh, forced. And she, she said, I don't like it. And I said, okay, we're getting rid of it. And we... Uh, we moved over to all American history. Actually, is what we did. So uh, it's not preachy. It is a Christian text, uh, but it's not uh, preachy and pushy. In a, and it feels natural. Emma says it doesn't have a sense of um, you know we got to stick Jesus in every chapter. It it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't have that feeling to it. So I, I really, as a mom, I really appreciate that, and she can learn from it. That is also one of the nice things about textbooks is usually you can do a little bit of homework on both the publisher and the author and find out where they're really coming from. You know, are they, you know, what, what is the worldview? What are the biases that are bound to show up? Uh, is there, is there an agenda that's behind the curriculum? Sometimes there's a really clear agenda and that may be an agenda that you subscribe to. And so that, that can be just fine. But if it's not, you need to be aware of that. And textbooks have the advantage of, you know, you can do your homework if they're out and about in the marketplace and find out, you know, what do people really say about this and what is the author really trying to communicate? You know, is if it's a Christian curriculum, do they gloss over the failings of the church through the centuries? Do they do they only portray Christians in a good light and everyone else in a bad light? Or are they, you know, a little bit more impartial and they don't mind saying, yeah, this is where we as a church or at least our, our ancestors as a church really went in the wrong direction. And it takes a certain amount of humility to be able to say that. And there's a lot of people who that's, that's a painful thing to admit. And so, you know, you can find some, even just some gross inaccuracies, you know, especially when you're dealing with religious history. And because there are so many viewpoints and you can find sources saying a lot of different conflicting things, that can be a really difficult thing to sort through. Um, but And that's where something like online reviews can be exceedingly helpful because people will point those things out. And I think that's another advantage to using a history textbook as a spine is that uh, you are, are pulling in other resources and you're getting multiple views of an event or time period so that you're not just hearing it from one perspective. And I think that lets kids be more able to uh, make a better decision when they hear lots of different perspectives. Um, Jennifer Bernstein is watching outside on the event page and uh, she has a young daughter and uh, Jennifer actually helps people kids, high schoolers get into college, so she's very much in the education scene, and she says her daughter is already very sensitive to the tone of text. I, I can just tell by watching Jennifer on social media that her daughter is very gifted, and uh, I think her daughter and my daughter are very similar in that, and some kids do get extremely sensitive to that, so you're not going to know, as you said, Tyler, until you try it, so that's a good idea to talk to the publisher of a textbook, get a sample, try it out. Uh, for example, Mystery of History, we offer the volume one in four quarters on Amazon Kindle. So you actually could buy at a very low price the first quarter, I think it's four or five dollars, you could download that digitally and see if you liked the tone. If you found the tone bothersome, you could switch to something else, but uh, it's a great idea is to test out a textbook to make sure it's going to work with your family because all kids are different. So, uh, other thoughts about using a textbook, ladies, or Tyler? Another one of the advantages that I think is that textbooks tend to reduce the amount of teacher prep involved. Mm -hmm. I remember doing ancient civilizations in high school, 
and we didn't have Mystery of History at the time. That was <laughs> that was before it was published. But I just remember watching my mom spend hours and hours and hours. And and she had a scope and sequence book, but she just did all of the research herself. And that was so time consuming. Now, I mean, she's a history buff, so she had a blast. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but having a textbook that's already written can just save you so much time if you don't want to be the one to be a you know a, a scavenger <laughs> out hunting and gathering information for your kids. And you know, another thing that's really nice about textbooks is if you have a kid who loves to read, that's a perfect fit. There's so much information. It's all right there at their fingertips. And you know, oftentimes people will use textbooks just as reference materials, but kids who love to read can just sink their teeth into something like that. And that I think is a an easily overlooked advantage of the textbook approach. That's a great point. Uh, and I wanted to also ask, do you all think that it's important for teenagers as they get older, as they get into high school years, to learn how to use a textbook? Do you think it would be a negative for a child to go all the way through and never use a textbook? Heather, you want to comment on that? Yes, I think it would be a negative thing. I think before they leave high school, they have to make friends with the textbook because regardless of where you go to school, if you are going to college, you're going to need to be able to read a textbook and read it fast because if whatever happens during the semester, um, the syllabus rolls on and you're going to have to be hitting that book for any number of your courses a lot and you're going to have to remember it and sometimes that's the only way outside of class you're going to get the information that you need um, from to reinforce the lectures that happened. Um, and you need to be able, I, before I send my kids off to school, they have to be able to read and um, sort of get the information they need from texts and they need to be able to write about what they read. And if they can do those two things, um, I think they'll have a really good start in going to school beyond high school. Good point. And, you know, traditional textbooks are actually, in many ways, easier for kids to digest if, if they're not too boring. And the reason I say that is because of the high structure, the subheadings, the questions at the end of the chapter, the bolded vocabulary words, uh, little timeline charts, the uh, little graphics and little captions. And so it's almost as if they're spoon feeding the kids. And that's sometimes a criticism of textbooks is it's almost too easy for kids. Um, but it's really not a hard transition. Um, for kids to move from uh, say a living book approach or unit study approach over to textbooks once they are in that higher level of middle school or high school it's really not that hard for them and I think sometimes people make it out to be this huge transition it's really not that hard for kids to do that. Other thoughts about textbooks? I would say one other thing to be thinking about when you're researching textbooks is the expense. Because with a lot of the, uh, the eclectic methods of homeschooling, there's a lot of stuff that you can do for free. But textbooks, they can be pricey. So if you're going to use a textbook, um, depending on the subject, you, you need to consider, OK, is, can, I, can I fit this $60 to $120 item in my shopping cart, or is that going to, to burst the seams on my wallet? So, and because it's something that it is a major investment, both in money and in time, they are worth doing a little bit of extra research. You know, it's not like a, you know, a $5 throwaway kind of thing. I mean, a lot of families, you know, $5 is not a throwaway at all, much less a $50 item. So you, you just need to be aware of that, you know, and, and also check out the return policy of whatever store you get it from. Because if, you get it and you know it looked great online and f three weeks into it you're like okay we're just not gonna happen you wanna know okay is there is there a 30 or a 60 day return policy did I make sure not to write in it <laughs> and just little things like that you, you just have to be aware of if it's not a company or an author that you're already familiar with and that you know you're pretty happy with already 
But if it's a, a well-known curriculum, I think reselling it, of course, at a loss, but reselling it at a used price is always an option. And uh, for example, that curriculum I didn't like, I quickly sold it to someone else who loved it. So uh, if, if it is a well-respected name, you will be able to find a buyer for it. You will be able to get some of your money back. Um, Tisha is outside on the event page, and, and she said, the structure of Christian Kids Explore is helping my kids with their science this year. And we've been talking a lot about history spines, but we don't want to forget that you can have a spine for science as well and yes we keep talking about our products uh, we're very proud of them but Christian Kids Explore is a science series and it has all of the main sciences in it and uh, so you can use it as a spine to take you through the different areas of the, that different field of science and you can branch off from there uh, that textbook has both lessons and hands-on exper uh, experiments activities so it's kind of got the best of both worlds it is designed for lower ages not for high school and so, yeah, you can use the science spine as well. Uh, have either of you ladies used the Christian Kids Explore Science? You guys are frozen. I can't see you moving. No, we have not. Okay, there you go. Sometimes it freezes up. Uh, Tyler, would you share a few words about the, the, our science um, series? Sure. Well, we've got five volumes. There's biology, earth and space, creation science, chemistry, and physics. And they're designed for third through eighth grade. And the, the interesting thing about them is that uh, it was a homeschooled mom who de developed the first two, uh, the biology and the earth and space. And she was actually developing it because her son and myself were doing biology in high school using a different textbook. And she wanted something that she could do with, uh, with my, my friend's younger siblings. So she started using the same structure that was in the high school book. She figured, well, I mean, why, why reinvent the wheel here? But let's just make it age appropriate for my, my elementary and middle schoolers. So they definitely have that sense of structure that you would find in the high school or, or sometimes even a college textbook, um, but they also have that sense of adventure and fun and hands-on experience that you really want to have, especially with kinesthetic learners in the early years. And the, uh, the other three volumes were written by a different author, but they have that same spirit of, okay, let's think about the structure that you would find in the high school course and adapt it so that the younger ones are going to be able to keep up with it and that these concepts won't be completely foreign. So when you're studying, you know, energy and motion and, and all these other concepts in physics, a lot of it is stuff that you will repeat if you do that in high school. But this time around, you know, in high school, you'll be adding in all the math and doing much more difficult lab assignments. Um, but it's a good preparation. And I think that's one of the real strengths of the Christian Kids Explorer series is that it it manages to keep the same structure that you would expect in a in a heavier textbook while having that same sense of fun that you need with the younger ages and the hands-on learners. Thanks, Tyler. Heather, uh, you said something about your daughter being a little artistic and maybe you modify the textbook a little bit. Explain some of that for us. So we're using All American History Volume 2 and we use that as a spine but the kids read every chapter and they they do the work that goes with the chapter so it includes uh, a review and some for further studies which for high school you want to use those and rather than have um, her do the for further studies as they're written she gets to make some choices and so it's really important I think to be flexible especially if you're coming from a background of not really using textbooks to kind of keep that flexibility because really you don't have to do it um, and if it makes everybody sort of miserable that's not really helpful so she does two different things she actually writes history quests for my blog so she picks something out from a chapter that strikes her something that she wants to find out more about it might be in the section on for further studies or it might not and she'll write something that other kids can go explore for my blog and then the second thing she does is she is a seamstress and loves to design and she does um, fashion with every time period so she has an assignment to read um, 
authentic sources on what people wore and then she does her own design and then she makes a garment um, and so and then she has to because we're preparing a portfolio she's in ninth grade she has to document her designs and so that she'll have something to show for that later only in homeschool, right? Could you make clothes for history? Uh, it's brilliant. I want everyone to know that this is at blogsherow.org. You need to check out the, the history quest, the geography quest, and the clothing posts. Uh, you know, Heather is one smart mama. She keeps her daughter happy and she gets fodder for her blog. I mean, she is multitasking left and right smart woman. I want to share Kyle's comment. She agrees with Tyler that textbooks are much easier on mom as far as planning and that's why she uses a mix of textbooks with living books. So uh, we love that idea and of course as we said that is the very foundation of the whole Illuminations program is using a quality history spine and combining it with other living books and it even has your know, history and geography. Bible and other topics uh, tagged onto it as well. It's very integrated. So, um, any closing thoughts about textbooks? I think we're going to be wrapping it up here. Yeah, Tyler. Well, a, a couple more things. One is that not every subject that you study, especially in high school, needs to be super duper challenging and extensive. There are a lot of credits that are just, they're required, but they have nothing to do with where your kid is going. And they have nothing to do with what their their interests are, or and you just you have to do them, but you don't want to spend extra hours on them if you don't have to. I remember when I was in high school, I had a a consumer math textbook that was that wasn't a, a state requirement, but it was a dad requirement, and it was nice and simple. You know, go through this book. Here's how many chapters there are. Here many. <laughs> here's how many weeks are left until graduation. Get X number of problems done. Here's the test booklet, and we'll call it good. And you know, it, it prompted some conversations outside of the textbook, but for the most part, I just needed to get through the material, absorb it, be able to work it out, and that was it. So sometimes. A nice simple textbook, you know, you, you talked about people criticizing textbook, textbooks for being too easy. That's not necessarily a fault. Sometimes you want something that's nice and easy that'll just get you through what you got to do and move on to something else that's more engaging or more, you know, crucial for the life of your kid. Now, I did not have a ton of time in, in math outside of what was really needed. Um, and I was a theater major, and, and that was okay. <laughs> they, they, they didn't quiz me on my algebra and geometry when I was doing history of dramatic literature. So, you know, when, when you're talking about, you know, mixing uh, textbooks and living books and using it as a spine, you know, that kind of eclectic approach, I think, really works well for most families, you know. You have the freedom to customize to your heart's content, and having a textbook there, whether that's your spine or whether that's, you know, the, the whole thing, just gives you the confidence about knowing, okay, I haven't missed anything super important, I've covered my bases, and, and we're good to go. Okay, so Tyler, speaking of covering your bases, uh, Madeline is out on the event page and she asked a really good question. She said, when I was teaching high school, we seldom were able to finish a particular textbook. Is it important for homeschoolers to complete a textbook? It's a brilliant <laughs> question, isn't it? Tyler, you want to, really yeah, question. answer that. I'll, I'll say it depends. Some mm -hmm. people have to finish it just because they need to practice finishing things and particularly teenagers who have a tendency to just kind of slough things off and, and do half-done jobs, sometimes that pressure of, okay, you got to get through the last chapter and the last problem before we call it quits, that's just a character-building thing. Um, in terms of whether or not it's, you know, a legit high school credit, that's another important thing to consider. Um, some textbooks are way more than a credit, Others, you have to supplement them to get them to even be worth half credit. And that just is a matter of knowing, well, what is a credit in my state? And that varies from state to state. You know, how, how do they define a credit? Um, and sometimes it's helpful to look at, you know, well, how many hours am I spending teaching this? And how many hours are they spending doing their homework? And, 
and judge it by hours instead of by chapters. I remember when I was taking Spanish, uh, my Spanish teacher's son was dual enrolled at the time, and he was taking Spanish at the uh, at the local high school, and she was looking at his Spanish textbook and comparing it to the one that we were using in our co-op, and where they were at the end of the year in, in the, the public school was at probably close to the end of their textbook, but it was nowhere near the end of our textbook content-wise. So textbooks are going to vary from book to book, so you'll have to be able to judge, did they spend enough hours, did they work their hardest, does it meet the requirements, and did they get through the content that they really need. So if it if you can say yes to all of those things before they finish the textbook, that's fine. You don't have to finish it as long as you can, you know, feel confident in your ability to say, yes, this was worth the high school credit that I'm going to write down on this transcript. Um, if you can't, then you probably need to keep working through it. Okay, Heather, I see you nodding. Did you, you and Marlene both, did you have comments about that, completing a textbook? Oh, I would just reiterate what um, Tyler said that, you know, it's a body of work. Did you get the body of work complete or did you not? Whether it's the number of hours you spent or the quality of the work that your child did, if you're only halfway through something, that, that may be a problem. But if you got three quarters of the way through and you did good work, it was a good year. <laughs> Excellent. Marlene, you have something else to add there? No, I, I totally agree with that. Like, you, you, it just really depends. Um, you got to look at the whole scope of work you've done for the school year. Um, like when my daughter was in a younger grade, there's a textbook that she was using that was amazing. I love it. I wish they kept going all the way up. It was for an, a language arts class. Um, and we, there was no way you could finish that book in the whole year. There's just so much information. But when she finished that year, I knew she was far beyond her years and what she had learned. Um, so I wasn't even stressed to finish it. And that's coming from someone who, like, has to do everything from A to Z. I was like, we're good. You know, we're set. Like, sometimes it's just, it's okay to stop at the end if if the year has been a good one, like, like everyone else has said. Great point. And I think uh, it becomes more important as kids get older to finish the book, and it's less important when they're younger. You know, when they're younger, you just explore, you do whatever you want. They really, you, you really can't mess up the younger they are, and the older they get, yeah, I need to be, you know, getting closer to finishing the textbook at least. Tisha, <laughs> Tisha, I love Tisha. Everybody, <laughs> last year was the first year we actually completed a textbook. But, you know, that's great because our kids are, like, intermediate elementary now, and that's appropriate. That's, a, you know, that I, I think she's actually doing great that she finished the textbook at that age. And, uh, Pat, welcome. Thank you for coming. We're thankful that you are out there as well. So, if there are any other questions, you guys post them quickly because we are wrapping up this uh, hangout about textbooks. One last thought about finishing a textbook is to ask the textbook itself, how does it define being finished? Because something like the mystery of history, there is so much more in there than any one family should ever attempt. You know, you will have three lessons a week, and each lesson has some level of hands-on activities, sometimes three or four different activities, and there's no way you can do all of that in a single week. So if you're trying to do everything in the book, it's going to take you years to finish that. So, and, and you know, in North Star Geography and the Teacher's Guide, I start off by saying, don't try and do everything. There are lots of different components here. Pick and choose what works for you. But if you try and accomplish all of this, you will probably burn out by lesson five. Um, which is unfortunately what I did with my co-op classes. I had them do everything, and my the parents in my co-op formed a support group <laughs> for <laughs> helping their kids finish all their stuff. So I, I I am one of those people who I just I want to do everything. I want my kids to do everything, but that's not the point. First off, and that's not always healthy. <laughs> in fact, it's almost never healthy to try and do everything if you've got a curriculum that is intentionally giving you a lot of options. And, I mean, we do, most of our books have a lot of options because we're trying to appeal to a wide variety of learning styles, and we trust the parents to pick and choose which is going to work best for their kids. So if your kid fits with learning style X, don't even worry about learning style Y activities. That's not written for you. 
and don't feel bad if you know you haven't crossed off all the activities because you weren't supposed to do them all it's a buffet and you can pick and choose and I think you're right I have heard many homeschool moms especially with the mystery of history they'll say you know we've been on volume one for two and a half years and I and I yeah and I think they do get kind of burned out you know they're really ready to move on and so there is a point where you can be labor something and add too much onto it it is okay to just do the textbook and move on you don't have to do every single little thing so it's a great point and Tyler uh, one more I had a question I, I know that North Star Geography if you do it as is it's worth one high school credit but if you do the extra things it's worth two or one and a half what is that <laughs> well when I did it with my test group I ended up awarding them either one AP level credit in geography or two credits one in human geography and one in physical geography because they had done so much work and uh, and their final exam in particular I had to tone that down before that went into the book um, because it was they had to list it, it was a matching quiz that had every single country in the world and that was that was probably 80 percent of their final exam I mean there is more to that I had one of the dads come up to me and say I have a master's degree and I never took a test this hard and, and and you know feedback is that like that is that's one of the reasons why we <laughs> run tests and why I'm not the only one who looks at this stuff before it goes to print but yeah I, I ended up giving my kids two credits because they had just gone over and above and when I looked at their work and their notebooks and all of the other stuff that they had done you know even outside of what was required it was just a tremendous body of work that they had produced and I felt that that really needed to be rewarded. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat says that she doesn't always finish textbooks as long as we don't have any gaps with the moving on to the next thing. After 21 years, it's still working for us. All right, so there's a veteran's voice, and she says it's okay to not finish a textbook sometimes. All right, great. So they are a foundation, a spine. You can use them as is. You can add on to them. Um, there are many advantages to textbooks. There are a few potential cons, but if you research your textbook choice carefully, we think you can avoid those and find a book that has a good tone that you can appreciate, and it will it can potentially really help uh, mom with planning her homeschool schedule because it is so comprehensive and very well laid out. So we encourage you to check out, of course, the brightideaspress.com store where we have a lot of great textbooks uh, that you can check out in history, um, geography, as well as science. Uh, I want to thank Heather Woody at blogshewrote.org and Marlene Griffith at a diligentheart.com and uh, Tyler Hogan. You can find Tyler at tylerhogan.com as well. He writes about things like geography. <laughs> he really loves maps and geography. So I would like to thank all of you for being with us today. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Uh, we have contact information on the brightideaspress.com site. You can leave us a comment here on the video at YouTube or on Google+. We will respond to you and, uh, and answer your questions that you have. Thanks again, everybody, and we're going to close for uh, this month, and we'll see you again next month for one last hangout of the year. Bye-bye.